What's up folks, Curly Artist here. So why is it called Ben 10 Omniverse? From the perspective of the show so far, we've had an arc about an evil pile of AI goo, which was good, but it doesn't exactly scream Omniverse. I wouldn't say there's a trace of what this name could mean in the first 22 episodes. Sure, there's flashbacks, but is that really exploring the Omniverse? I have a feeling the show is called Omniverse simply because they were stuck with that name. Now, hear me out. During Ben 10's earliest years of production, it filed a series of trademarks right around the time Alien Force was in development. Some of them you may recognize as working titles for the series, such as Hero Generation and Evolutions. In fact, due to this trademark timeline, it's plausible that Omniverse was a candidate as a name for the third series of Ben 10. But as we know, the title went to Ultimate Alien. And around when the third series premiered, an online MMORPG took the name Omniverse for itself. It's Hero Time! Which, despite coming across and being fascinated by the trailer, I never got a chance to play as it wasn't released in America. In fact, I didn't even think I knew this was an actual playable game until years after it ended. Then around the time Solitary Lyman aired nearly two years after Omniverse Rise of Heroes came out, the game went offline and a fourth series was in development. I theorized that they were told, hey, you can't keep buying all these trademarks if you're not gonna do anything with them. So for the fourth Ben 10 series, they had to use one of the trademarks they already had, and then build the show around that. And if you think about it, that could also also be why the Ultimate Aliens in Ultimate Alien weren't as much of a focus as that title was just selected from the batch they got in advance. It's pretty well known that Matt and Dwayne were developing Omniverse before the latter's passing, which evolved into the malware story spanning the first 20 episodes of the series, so regardless of what title they chose, the plot was locked in. And with the online game shutting down and the other names, while cool, don't have the same kind of ring as Omniverse, that's what they were left with. Pushing through the malware storyline, we now enter Season 3, where Dwayne's original plans have finished, and it's 100% new territory. So what better place to start developing the new direction for the show than making the title actually make sense? <laughs> So we go from an enjoyable but pretty standard Ben 10 arc to multiple alternate universes, time travel, time loops, a time war, even centering the 200th episode around a multiversal battle that destroys said Omniverse. And it all starts right here in Dimension 23. So Universe 23 is easily the most fleshed out alternate universe in Ben 10. It's usually summed up as a what if scenario where Ben receives the Omnitrix at 10 years old just like Ben Prime, but he didn't have the guidance of Grandpa Max. And with no sign of Gwen in his life, Ben went at the hero lifestyle alone, with no combat training, no moral compass, and most notably, no secret identity. Ben 23 isn't exactly a terrible person, I mean he's 13 years old, I can cut him a little slack, but the absence of Grandpa Max's guidance is immediately noticeable with the way he talks, his opinion and prejudice against aliens, and his terrible, terrible skills at naming his transformations. Vomit man, Mr. Monkey. This is also the start of a big turning point in what exactly classifies a universe, dimension, or timeline in Ben 10. Because over the next few seasons, we really dig into what the differences are. I do talk at length about this in a previous video, which I'll link down below, but regardless of those facts, at least for now, I'm going to follow this episode's lead and still just call it Dimension 23. Even though by the overarching logic of the show and even the admission of Derek J. Wyde himself, it's technically incorrect. And hey, it looks like you saw my video too. This episode's also fun because it uses a little bit of wiggle room to make some meta commentary and jokes, but this episode isn't all about that kind of stuff. It's just in there. I'm dropping freaking tomatoes everywhere. But if this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below, along with a link to all my previous breakdowns. But by all means, watch this video first. I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. It's Euro time! But first I got some updates. Like you saw in the little sizzle at the beginning of this video, 5YL episode 8 of the motion comic is out. I'm so proud of it, we did a lot of fun stuff with it, and you can listen to both versions of the Ember cover coming soon on YouTube, Spotify, and the official soundtrack release. YouTube memberships are also live as well, which you can support us for the same rewards as Patreon. You can find the join button down below. And my commissions are still going strong as well. I made a little button on our Twitch that links you to all of the steps and rules on how to commission me if you're interested in that. And yeah, now a quick word from our sponsor. Hey, you guys like our content, right? Damn right you do. That means you like comics, stories, and animations. Well, with today's sponsor, Storyiverse, you can immerse yourself in the next evolution in visual media. Storyiverse is a mobile app that delivers original, mature, animated shorts in a new, unique read, watch, and format. Enjoy a wide range of platform-exclusive stories, showcasing the distinct voices and visuals from creators around the world. From sci-fi to horror, 2D to 3D, go on a multi-sensory journey with Storyiverse. Being an artist myself, my schedule is always packed, and I never have time to read anymore. 
but with story versus short form content, I can replace doom scrolling with really cool narrative experiences. I just finished a story called The Sorcerer, which was hella dark, but honestly, it has this really cool twist ending, and I really hope the author writes a follow up. Story of Verse is free to download for Android and iOS devices. Click the link below to start re watching now. Don't forget to follow Story of Verse on TikTok and Insta for new exclusive teasers and trailers for new stories. Thank you, Story of Verse, for supporting our content. On January 26, 2013, Matt Wayne gave us Store 23. Ben, Blukic, and Dreba run into Professor Hoaxstar at his dimension hopping Mr. Smoothie, but find themselves stranded in a world where a new hero, Ben 23, takes the reins in place of Ben Prime. The two have a lot of moral differences, but get along pretty well. But when the intellectuary shows up to take his hero watch, the two Bens must team up to defeat this alleged evil entity. <laughs> All right, be honest. Did anybody catch that that was Edel in their first viewing? It's hard for me to remember. I feel like I did, but I wasn't totally sure. You only really see him for like, what is that, three frames? Yeah, and then Ben changes back. I always thought that was super cool, though. Sort of like how you see Ben transforming out of Ultimate Echo Echo and Ultimate Alien for that episode. How are the energy cuffs, Dumbozo? Comfortable? We're starting out right in the middle of the action. Are we really fighting over stolen eggs? Man, they're in the air a while. <laughs> okay, I've talked about this plenty of times before, but this is the episode where it happened, so I at least have to mention it again. I cannot believe this episode aired out of order. Because of this scene right here. I remember seeing this when the episode drops. And then going to the message boards and everyone's going crazy. Like, how could 16-year-old Ben use feedback? And this was before Showdowns Part 1 and 2. So it totally ruins that whole arc. And that arc was like the foundation of Omniverse 2. And just... This is like the biggest L Cartoon Network ever did to Ben 10, honestly. Oh, this is like a remix of the feedback theme. Listen to that. You hear those drums? How are you supposed to catch a turbocharged getaway car with a living extension cord, doofus? It's hero time! This phone has no camera, though. How's she filming this? Is, is this the camera? There's a lot of worried Vaxasaurian parents right now. What do they have to worry about? Against Liam? The sweet Ben 10 video that's about to go viral? Ah, uh, it's crazy how that doesn't even sound new anymore. I remember being impressed whenever I'd hear TV shows start adapting, like, the new wave of internet culture. And this aired in, like, what, 2013? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Time. It passes, right? Check it out. Over the shoulder. That is really good aiming, though. Chicken dance! <laughs> He's not even watching, he's like trusting that he's making all these hits and making Liam do exactly what he wants to. That's pure skill. This is right up there with diamond head levels of accuracy. Cool your jet. Don't toy with the villains. I mean, he's been doing that since he was a kid, though. It's honestly kind of weird that Max has an issue with it now. Maybe it's because Ben's getting older now, so he's like, you shouldn't be acting like this anymore. Which, in some strokes, I agree, but like, I don't know, this, this is just a weird angle. For this far into the continuity, you know? Like, why is Max not cool with this now? And after all this time, wearing the most powerful weapon in the universe. He called it a weapon. And I still don't understand the responsibility I have. I mean, he defeated Liam, though. He got him. And this is also supposed to be the same Ben that gave up infinite power so that everybody can have free will. So, like, he does understand it. And as much as I'm always more in favor of Ben taking things seriously, he's got Liam down on lock. Like, he can mess with him for a little bit. This is how he should be treating Fistrick, you know? Like, if you're gonna put Ben up against street-level heroes, at least make them seem this pathetic to him. Like, this is nothing. They're bad, I'm good. The end. Now, that is something I still feel like Ben struggles with. He's got a good heart and he's got great morals, but it still always comes down to good versus evil. Sometimes I feel like he has hope for not seeing things that black and white, like when he met Reini, or offering Kevin to join his team. So this also just feels like a bit of a stretch for Ben's characterization, but it's also something we never got like a genuine solution on either. Versus Ben messing with the villains, it's like that, that's honestly not a big deal. I'm getting a smoothie. I need a drink. Oh, we're back here. Blue Kick Chandriba's lab. Is this a different hat? Oh, yeah, it is. I wonder if it always switches up and I've just never noticed. Blue Kick Chandriba. I try not to be super de duper redundant in these breakdowns, but man, Omniverse really does go so hard with the backgrounds every single time. Like, why does this look this good? I don't even know what this is. Mr. Smoothie. We're finally gonna find that elusive store 23. Which was first mentioned in their smoothie episode. Is a map of the 23 Mr. Smoothie's locations. 23? I only know 22. I love whenever they do soft foreshadowing like that. So now we gotta be in dimension 23, Ben 10. Ben 10. This is the same rooftop when Crash Hopper was chasing Esther throughout the city. This could be a wild, omnivoracious chase. Which we now know is their predator. A lot of subtle continuity in this episode. I even think this is the first casual use of the 10 speed. 
Yep, it is. The Mr. Smoothie's website makes no mention of a 23rd store. You know, back then I would have said it's pretty weird that a website has its own built-in GPS tracker, but a fair amount of food establishments, at least over here in the US, has the Google Maps plugin built into their site so you can find it. So this is actually pretty standard. But we've seen store 23 on your GPS. On and off, here and there, and in different places. It's interesting that they don't consider it's not actually a smoothie store. Like we later find out it really is, but with the random teleporting and vanishing location of this thing that's shown up on their screen, they're still like, yeah, it's it's a Mr. Smoothie. We just don't know how it does this. My first thought would be, maybe it's not a Mr. Smoothie. And I would have been wrong, so who am I to argue with the Galvins? You're getting a call. Would that be considered the Omnitrix's ringtone? You're getting a call. Boop, boop, pop, boop. Let it go to voicemail. Only 22. Nope, there it is. It would be nuts if, like, this grid actually lined up with the sky shot we get of Bellwood in a handful of episodes. Like, how mapped out is Bellwood? Wouldn't it be crazy if it was that accurate? Corner of Pugsley and Klein. Reference to Tom Pugsley and Greg Klein, the iconic writing duo from the classic series. I'm pretty sure there was a reference to their names as well somewhere, but, like, in a much older episode. Proceeding west on Pugsley Boulevard near Klein Avenue. Damn. Also, this is an interesting location for Mr. Smoothie. This is like a McDonald's you'd see in New York. Before it vanishes, if you look right here, the sidewalk is flush against the building, but then the bricks pop in. So this Mr. Smoothie and this brick wall weren't drawn precisely the same. It's gone! Does he do that mentally? <laughs> what do you think happens to this building when the Mr. Smoothie's here? Does it get displaced wherever the smoothie just was? Will nobody come out to show us? Ah uh, yes, the infamous cow and chicken reference, voiced by their original voice actor, Charlie Adler, who we know as Professor Hoaxstar. Isn't it wonderful, big brother? I am going to be a model. Will nobody come out to show us? Hey, pal! That is my sister you got your mitts all over. Sister, you just said a mouthful of so This is a nice little way to, like, emphasize that they're doing alternate universes. And the chicken alien is also the same species as Liam. But as the years go on, this reference gets more and more obscure. I don't think cow and chicken had enough of a lasting legacy for people to not pick up on this. I barely picked up on this because I wasn't even a fan of cow and chicken. To be honest, I don't even know what that show would have been about. Like, what do they do every episode? What the fuck is that thing? <laughs> Well, they're definitely not going home. <laughs> See, this shot too, this is just full of detail. Look at this little thing right here. Professor Hoaxstar? So it's no secret I'm not a big fan of Hoaxstar's character, but I do think he's used pretty well in this episode because he's able to get them into this dimension hopping scenario. And he's not actually in this episode a lot, so I can look past it, but I just, man, I can only take so much Hoaxstar. Hold a Mr. Smoothie that exists in every dimension at once. Well, not at once, but maybe that's what he's going for and he just hasn't achieved that yet. Just as soon as I get this one. Field generator. Okay, yeah, so he hasn't figured that part out yet. But can you imagine every dimension at once? Like, people would be waiting in line for infinity. You can't serve customers in every single universe, but go for it, Hoaxstar. Let's let's see how this plays out. I'd be amazed. We're not moving between places. We're staying in one place while rotating through different dimensions. So there's a reason why this wouldn't work, and it actually fucks with a lot of time travel movies as well. It's a fallacy that I'm willing to excuse, though, just because most stories just straight up can't happen without it, but you have have to move in place if you move through dimensions or time as well. Because the Earth isn't static in space. It's rotating around the sun and the entire solar system is hurtling through space. So wherever you are right now, if you wanted to go 10 years back in time and truly not move on your plane of existence, you would just be floating in space because the Earth would be all the way wherever it was 10 years ago. It hasn't arrived at this spot yet. And again, it ruins a lot of stuff like Vilgax attacks for a direct Ben 10 connection where they say that they only moved through time and not space. haven't even moved. In space, no, but in time. Impossible paradox, because then that building wouldn't be there. It'd be like 50 feet to the left or however the math would add up. Or back to the future where they travel through time but not space. The DeLorean would just be floating somewhere in the solar system because the Earth would be wherever it was 30 years ago. I guess I forgot to record the rest of why this is important because for one, you're going to have to assume that every dimension has the Earth moving in the exact same spot at the same time, which is impossible. Could it be possible that Dimension 23's Earth is moving exactly like Ben Prime's Earth? Sure. But since later on it's explained that all of these alternate realities are branched off of Ben's timeline and Ben 23 is no 
noticeably younger. You could argue that Hoaxar accidentally went back in time as well, because why are these two Bens two different ages if they're born from the same nexus point of the multiverse? I don't know, there's a lot of different factors to this, but basically, whether you travel through time or travel through dimensions, you can't trust that the same location is always in exactly the same spot. Hi, hello. Let us discover just where we have been stranded. <laughs> Only lasts a couple of seconds, but this is actually our first look at Ben 23 right here on this sign. No outlines though. No outline solid colors is a good way to like paint backgrounds and stuff, but Omniverse usually does outlines anyways. Its art style is pretty outline centered. Looks like Bellwood. <laughs> So we've seen a lot of these characters in Ben's Dimension as well. And our first look at Tetrax in a long time. Our only look at Tetrax in Omniverse. Unfortunately, we only see his Dimension 23 counterpart. But I love his outfit. It's a combination between the outfit from Classic and a plumber suit. Now, the logistics of a Petrosapien growing a beard, aside from aesthetic purposes, used to bother me a little bit for this. Because Tetrax would have had to make this happen. They don't just grow beards over time. But I also don't really care anymore. Ben Tennyson. Right here, Tetrax. Although this is another scenario where if Omniverse was your gateway into the show, you'd have no idea who this guy is or why Ben knows him. Tell me what's going on? You know, some viewers probably expect me to get upset about the Omnitrix activating this way, but honestly, this is how it should be activating. It should be neurologically connected into him by now in a part of his biology. Mistransforming by not looking at the dial. Ugh. Like, Ben should be this experienced and intertwined with the Omnitrix by now. Who are you? Stick a fork in yourself, alien scum. Here he is. You're toast. Ben 23, folks. We made it. Now, I remember in his debut, he used to be a divisive character, People either loved him or hate him, but I see nothing but praise for Ben 23 now. I think that's just because people were still back on the we hate Justin Bieber trend, which that wasn't a great era. Actually, in fact, I think by then we were supposed to be over it. How old was Justin Bieber in 2013? Like, I'm not off base by going so Justin Bieber heavy with my influence on this, right? Like, this is clearly a reference to Justin Bieber. But yeah, this very heavily plays into the, at the time, the preppy, stuck up, spoiled rich kid vibe. Be wearing ties in ironic ways. I did do a Ben 23 still for 5YL and try to take influence from how this sort of persona is perceived and executed in the 20s. But yeah, this is quite the approach to Ben. And of course, he's voiced by Tara Strong. I think this is Tara's first time voicing a Ben that's not 10 or 11. He's ambiguously confirmed to be like 12 or 13. I don't think they ever like wanted to give him a specific age, but I always just say 13. Oh, you know what? It was confirmed on his model sheet. Okay. I was just assuming, but it's it's dope that we do have confirmation. Ben 23 has found another evil alien threat. Now, this is interesting to me because I feel like there's two ways you can look at this dimension. On one hand, you can take it as this is exactly what the prime timeline would be like if Grandpa Max died early and Ben didn't get to grow up with him. But on the other, there's some things that exist in this dimension that don't in the prime no matter what. The most obvious thing being the predominantly blue color schemes. But stuff like this, is this just a core part of this dimension and would be here no matter what, like the blue hues and everything? Or would somehow Ben growing up without Max lead to a increased advancement in how Earth adapts technology and perhaps even the prime universe can have things like this? Hero will our champion! turn into. That would be kind of cool though, seeing that in person and betting which alien he'd become. Although this is like a real threat. It's like if a bunch of people broke into a bank and started gunning people down and you'd vote, how are the police gonna stop him? It's like, this is, this is real. No, I hate those. I know sometimes they give him a lazy eye, but this is the most different they've ever done the pupils. First, everything looks normal. But then wham, you find out that super intelligent dolphins won the civil war. It's hard to take that line seriously, but if you think about it, both Dwayne and Derek have joked that dolphins are sentient enough for the Omnitrix, so like, what if that was, like, something that also could have happened in the prime timeline? Like, intelligent dolphins really could have won the Civil War or something, and that just didn't happen in Ben's dimension. That'd be fucking hilarious. <laughs> Freeze lizard! Why are you shouting your name? It's stupid. Also, we see that the casing around his dial is gold. I love that detail. I like how he's not all blue. He's got like a hint of gold in there. It's Freeze Lizard! Who voices the announcer? Eric Bowser, of course. Who, who could have seen that coming? Not me, I guess. Stop by any Mr. Euro for a free 32 ounce soda! This is also what introduced the word Euro to me growing up. Mr. Euro! And I've had quite a few Euros since then, and I love them. How many people were introduced to Euros through this episode? Every single Mr. Smoothie is a Mr. Euro in this universe! His pupils, too. Like, what's going on this episode? Hey, bro, go crazy! Last time, I took your hoverboard, alien! Because Tetrax used to have a hoverboard in our timeline, and was called hoverboard on a lot of pre Soto merchandise. <laughs> I still like when Petro Sapiens shift their arms into spikes to do the Gatling gun attack, but seeing the crystals mesh through the palms, I'll, I'll give it a pass this time. Hey man, not cool! Some great smoke animation right here. You know, when I first saw Arthur Guana in Ben 10,000, I did not expect him to be this athletic. 
This man's trying to sail away right now. I might change history. Should I interfere? This is dimension travel, not time travel. You hear that, folks? There is a difference. <clears throat> Whoa, why is he so fucking fast? You see that? Zoom. <laughs> Look at him go. I love Artiguana right now. Did he jump this whole building in one leap? Damn, Tetrax. Back down. It's hero time. Should that count? You know, I want to debate if that should count for hero time or not. But in the classic series, I used to be stingy that going hero doesn't count as it's hero time. So I guess this shouldn't count. But I did count Gwen's it's heroes time. So you know what? Fight about it in the comments. I'll see what people are more in favor of. I was even thinking about retroactively counting going hero. Because after all this time, I feel like it really didn't matter to separate them as much. But then I would have to go back and check every episode for all the going heroes and ugh. You guys stay behind and help fix the store's generator. This is a small detail, but I like whenever you see characters change their costumes too. Like when you see Ben switch from his soccer jersey to his jacket. Usually in cartoons, you only see them change outfits between scenes. You'd all better keep a low profile. I'm not too sure they like aliens here. You're gonna give that to Hoaxstar and trust him with it? You had to reboot the whole universe to get that hoodie. That thing's priceless. It's better than the best. It's Ben! This should be obvious, but I'm only noticing it now. Is Mr. Yero supposed to vaguely resemble Mr. Smoothie? Like, you know what? Of course it is. Like, yeah. Why didn't I put that together before? Yeah! <laughs> What? Oh, he smacks his, his stomach to activate his teleporter. Okay. Hold it, alien. Did the intellectuary send you? Never heard of him, but don't worry. Another instance where you hear the Omnitrix timeout, even though Ben slaps his chest anyways. I think you and I are sort of related. Dude. That's honestly pretty awesome. As much as it'd be cool to see two Omnitrix wielders fight, we kind of already got that a few times, and it shows that across universes, all the Bens have this synergy with each other. I'd even argue that if the bad Bens weren't corrupted by Vilgax, they all could have been buddies too. Oh, but this was hype seeing this again. I haven't seen this in Soto. There's a second Ben Tennyson. We'll take care of them both. By nature, you're going to root and side for Ben. And with the way they're setting up this shot with Tetrax and Azmuth, you would think that in this universe, they're the villains. I like that little misdirect there. The only hint you have towards them not being villains is the fact that Tetrax's suit vaguely resembles a plumber suit, which, since this is a new art style and it's the first time you're seeing it, might not click as well. You might just think, oh, well, that's just how he looks in Omniverse. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Was this guy caught in the battle? Why is his shirt ripped up like that? And this is exactly like the layout for Mr. Smoothie. Although they don't have the big Mr. Euro logo. This is like old school Mr. Smoothie. Ben 23 hasn't destroyed his universe yet. Ben 10, huh? I'm 13 better than that. Yeah, but does yours rhyme? The richest, most famous guy in the world. I want to say they stopped doing the Ben kind of talks like this in his subsequent appearances. Either that or I'm just used to it when I see him more. But whenever I watch this episode, his slight pitches up stand out so much to me. You know who else does that a lot? Rexplode and Invincible. I feel like that guy is always kind of talking like this. Okay, first rule, no rule in those eyes. My pizza's getting cold. Yeah, not quite the same setup in my- I remember there being some theories that this is Dimension 23 Bauman. Pretty sure it's not though, I mean, why would Bauman be working at Mr. Smoothies? Then again, why is Tetrax wearing a plumber suit? I don't know, anything could happen. I am famous, but not rich and- I mean, if anybody in the world is willing to give you whatever you want, do you need to be rich? I'm pretty sure Ben could just walk in anywhere and eat for free. Wow, you get a shirt, a foam finger, two crayons, a box, and a little plush toy. In this dimension, you don't get a toy with your meal. You get a meal with your toys. These things also show up in a later episode. Load them up, hamster cages. Stuffed euros. You hear that though? Stuffed euros. It's like freaking three octaves up. Stuffed euros. My goodness, does he do that in his later episodes? I, we gotta wait till then. You must really love your euros. <laughs> Yokel food. Jeez, Ben, this is your whole brand and you're gonna diss it? Come on, buddy, Euros are pretty good. These guys will hook you up for free. Yeah, I'm more of a smoothie guy. Yeah, but you can't eat smoothies. Frank, there aren't any more movie cups. He's got an agent named Frank. You see that, Ben? Because Grandpa Max lived, you never got to meet Frank. I turned into Giant Manster and accidentally stepped on it. Giant Manster is his way big, by the way. There was some debate on whether or not that was his. His Vaxasaurian form is called Dino Mighty, which you'll see in a later episode. Why only Ben 10? It used to be 10. Now I have more than 70. I love that he says he has more aliens than we've seen, so it gives a lot of leeway for him to just start dropping them out. More like, uh, 50, uh, 90! That was a very weird delivery. Was that supposed to imply he's lying, or he just couldn't remember? How do you roll yours out? I mean, how do you stoke the demand? I feel like this conversation could count for a meta joke, but it also seems like something they would genuinely talk about. No more autographs! <laughs> I know that's supposed to make him look like a jerk, but Ben Prime did the same thing. What? 
What? What happens if Vilgax attacks? Never heard of him. I'm gonna start a wild theory here. So he doesn't have Grandpa Max anymore, right? And he's also never met Vilgax. And Vilgax happened super early in Ben's career. Like within the first couple of weeks. So I want to theorize Vilgax came after Ben 23 and Grandpa Max took him head on because he didn't trust that Ben 23 was ready to fight Vilgax. And the only way to defeat Vilgax was for him to take himself out as well. Maybe in a similar vein to the Null Void Projector thing. Because not having Grandpa Max and not having Vilgax when they're so connected and both were very early in Ben Prime's career, that's like a big difference for him to have. Who ordered the calamari? Oh, he does talk. He's also voiced by Tetrax's voice actor, Dave. A share in store 23 could be profitable. I wonder if they were brought to this dimension because this was the 23rd store. It's a big coincidence that their 23rd Mr. Smoothie is also in dimension 23. Also, just to note, we're like halfway through the episode and we're only just getting to the good stuff. I know I've had a lot to talk about, but that's just as a Ben 10 fan. But content wise, it feels like nothing's really happened in this episode. But it's also just fascinating to me. Like it's it's very well paced so far. I think the writing's good. I think everything's good. But it's the Ben 10 fan in me is like itching to just watch Ben and Ben 23 interact the whole time. And honestly, if we got the kind of fan service in this episode that we wanted, it probably wouldn't be as good of an episode. I think this episode tells a solid story. I just want to see more Ben and Ben 23 interacting and comparing aliens and fighting together than Blue Kitchen Trebo working on some shit in Hoaxar's store. We've only seen one alien so far, Arctic Guana, and he's like, not exactly a fan favorite. That ought to hold. I like how the explosions are different colors though, playing into the rainbow aura of dimension travel as frequently shown throughout Omniverse. 23rd dimension, 23 on the delineator, store 23, Ben 23. Okay, all right, there, there, it's a plot point. I kind of forgot about this part of the episode. Numeric concatenation. <laughs> A lady. Although this, I guess, is a interesting and kind of necessary scene. If the whole point of them arriving in this store is Hoaxar's trying to open up a dimensional shop, you do kind of want to see what it would be like for them to pull it off. So I like that we're tackling this route. Maybe if it was a two-parter, I'd feel more comfortable with these scenes. It's just like the part of me that's like, what makes a good story versus I want to see alternate universe Ben stuff. You got to have a balance. Team customer, but I am obviously an alien. Just a moment. Here's a little detail a lot of people miss. Ben 23 lives in Nemesis Tower. Who is Alien 24? A little mystery, a little sucker bait. This is another sort of meta joke about hyping people up over new aliens, but also like in real life, I really believe that this would be something of Ben like this would consider. Is like, oh, people like new aliens? I should probably be more marketably strategic with how I roll them out. Looks like feedback. I was gonna go with Plug Man. Also, the running joke that Ben 23 is terrible at naming aliens. Although I feel like the joke does become less creative later on. I feel like in this episode, all the names, they are bad, but they are still somewhat unique. Like Electricity, Plug Man, Dog Nabbit. Later on, they just become like childish rhyming syllables. Teeny Weeny, Nighty Nighty, Windy Hindy. They're just not as great. Maybe Ben 23 canonically just gets worse and worse at naming his aliens, and that's on purpose. When feedback is revealed, I stop using one alien. Back into the Ben 23 vault? That is kind of how it works. In the show's distribution, whenever Ben would get new aliens, he'd stop using some before. But that's usually for a bunch of production reasons. Whereas in universe, if 23 really rolls one back every time he announces a new one, why is it called Alien 24 on the sign? And then he makes a big comeback. Uh-huh. I kind of like Ben's attitude here. It's showing that he's a lot more desensitized to the fame that Ben 23 is still fascinated with. There are moments where Ben Prime loves his fame, but I feel like Omniverse, he just starts getting so used to it, he doesn't care as much. Because right now, Ben 23 is just talking shop with marketing, and Prime Ben's just kind of like, I don't really see things that way. So to me, this is a good character moment for Ben. Ben, call me when you get this. Was that Grandpa Max? I haven't thought about him in years. There's no Grandpa here? This is another moment with very unfitting music. This adds on to my theory that I feel like a lot of cartoons to try to get around how heavy some themes and storylines might be. They add really goofy music to the scene to water down the seriousness. There's the Orange Offenders, alternate counterparts of the Violet Offenders, which we first saw in a flashback of Showdown Part 1. Maybe you flash me some more of your alien, one I haven't unlocked yet. Another difference in their personalities, the second that there's danger, it's all Ben could think about. Similar to when he heard the police scanner when he was about to drop Julie off at the airport. He just can't ignore danger, but Ben 23 here just doesn't give a fuck. Hey, we got cops for crooks and stuff. 
Although that is also a good point. I'm always arguing that Ben shouldn't have to worry about street level criminals with his status. And in this dimension so far with the stuff like the drones and how common knowledge aliens are, maybe the police are equipped with more advanced technology to handle these kind of crooks. So perhaps 23 is right in this scenario. Like he doesn't have to worry about this, but Prime is just like, bad guys, I must. So I feel like they're both like handling this in interesting and character accurate ways. You can't just let him get away. That's a cool maneuver, conducting his electricity through something rather than just shooting it as a raw beam. And you very quickly see them hold out surrender flags. Wait for the cops or something? Or plumbers. Why, you break a toilet somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, Q man. I feel like Hoaxstar would have been a better head. Push the banana very tough, my boy. <laughs> Aliens are much less accepted in this universe. Secret of the Hero Watch. This is a great shout out to the Secret of the Omnitrix movie. And two pretty well-known errors here. He doesn't have his hair shine and his Hero Watch is on the wrong wrist. Oh, look at that. Omniverse Ben using Merc Upchuck? That almost never happens. Mr. Mucky. Don't know him. So I love this scene for two reasons. One, again, it's just something I can see two alternate Bens doing. But two, we get a very brief flash of Molestash, which confirms that the outbreak aliens are always accessible to Ben. At the time, we didn't know if those transformations were only unlocked through an error, but here it's like, nope, Ben kept them. We also just get flashes between the aliens rather than morphs that Omniverse always does. My agent has an idea. I'm thinking reality show. A little more to it than that. Sure, there's the intellectuary. These aliens you turn into, they're not the only good ones. Where I come from, some just live in town, like my best friend. It is interesting that for three years, Ben never came across, or at least never considered the fact that there's good aliens out there. By the way, where's Gwen? The only things we know about her are from Derek, and she's shy and not an anodite. That's pretty lame. Like, why is she not an anodite? Why does that matter? My computer froze on this face. That's funny. This is a great missile design. It's got those classic series spot things on it. 6-6, six, six. that was a treat to see too. And you can see his suit is integrated with plumber tech as well. Also visually hinting towards the fact that maybe we're rooting for the wrong side here. Attention, we have another alien attack! So it seems like there's two kinds of drones, camera drones and speaker drones. Which hero will our champion turn into? Oh, look at that, five ox news. That's neat. Right. All right, so I've been looking for a spot to talk about this and I'm just gonna do it here. Design wise, I understand why all of Ben 23's aliens are tinted blue. An instant recognized ability that this isn't Ben Prime. And because Albedo's aliens were red, it plays more into the color scheme facts. But like, when you look at Ben Prime's aliens, even just the classic 10 alone, they're all sorts of colors. Ben's aliens are every color in the book, whereas all of his alternate selves are predominantly one color. And I think that kind of takes away from the magic a little bit. But this episode is just bleeding theories from me. And keep in mind, these are all just theories. I'm saying it now. But because in this episode, they emphasize that the trans-dimensional energy was rainbow. That was a cross-dimensional sun burst aurora more of a pinwheel shape and we see in later episodes it's a similar thought and ben prime's aliens are all colorful and ben prime is confirmed to be the trunk of the tree perhaps ben prime's universe is the most colorful universe because it's at the center and then where branches start coming off they're segmented through colors and each ben and by extension their universe being predominantly one color is a subtle way to emphasize that they are all deviations of the main thing but i also don't like the fact that ben 23's aliens are just recolors because as we've seen in the the classic series with Kevin and Gwen, and sort of in this series with certain characters like Mad Ben and Gwen Ten, their outfits and attitudes do play into how their aliens transform. Not always, but I always like when they do. So it would have been really nice to see Ben 23's outfit reflect on how his aliens come off. And I don't just mean the aliens wearing their outfits, I mean entirely different body shapes and stuff. <laughs> Really great action here. Hang on, Ben! We already saw Accelerate earlier. I would have liked to see somebody else here. Although for this scene, because of the code thing that's about to pop up, it makes more sense for Accelerate. So I would swap out Accelerate's first scene and keep this one. I'm always impressed whenever they actually draw out the numbers for stuff like this. Like that's a lot of effort. And even switches from like an alien looking text to earth numbers. Take him down, Ben! Yeah, working together. This is an interesting camera angle, being inside of the tunnel and looking out to see the action. You don't get a lot of blocking like this in animation. 
Oh, and somehow I've always missed this. Ben 23 has a logo and it's in the same classic series font. And we have a different news station than the Five Hawks news. We got 7C Info News. Is, is this based on something? But this is drawn as well. It's not digitally created. You can see a little bit of imperfections with the line work, but I kind of like that with Omniverse. Omniverse is always a little bit sloppy, but I think that's just part of it. <gasps> gotcha. A lot of people also have problems when speedsters do this because this implies that the technology can also react in super speed. Like if you slow down time, you can't just use the internet in fast motion. The internet's still gonna load in real time. So Ben entering all these codes over and over again, like thousands in a second, that device must have like the most insane processing power of all time to keep up with the Kinocellerin. Just gotta run through all the possible codes. Like, can you imagine that in Ben's POV? He's like 0001, 0002. He's probably like mentally there for hours. <laughs> That's another good shot too. You just see the reflection and he zooms on by, it cracks the window and shakes the car. I'm loving the shot choices in this episode. Cover your ears. So weird seeing Accelerate stand up straight though. And a very small detail, but also biblically accurate. The explosion is blue because they're in Dimension 23. Ben Prime's really showing Ben 23 how to get it done. He took out those orange offenders like that, also saved 23's life. Prime really knows what's up. But Prime isn't really in your face about it either. Maybe it's because it's himself, or maybe this is just one of the episodes where the writers really want Ben's maturity to shine, especially when compared to his younger self. Well, younger self, but you know. But I like that he's really like stepping into a leadership role. And yes, I'm going to talk about it because I see it. Look at those freaking wrists right there. Big layering error. I get it. I know. But I like that we're able to see him truly step into like a mentoring role, especially to like an alternate version of himself without him being like, you know, who's the hero about it? Now it's hero time. So you'd think that Ben 23 is doing this to like an in-universe camera, but the cameras are also going in too right here. What kind of shot are the cameras trying to get right now? Are they looking at us? Is this a fourth wall break? Oh, man. Hero time turns to Euro time, but aw oh, man is omniversal. Man, I love this shot. Electricity! He shouted his name too. I think he does this for the cameras though. He's also the only alien that both Ben's use in this episode, but he has like the worst color clash. Why did they decide to keep the yellow with this blue? That does not look good. Heat blast! I had charcoal, man. Is it just me or does 23's shock squatch not have the Canadian accent? Oh, nice! I had charcoal, man. Do you think Ben's faking accents with heat transforms? We're on to you, Ben. <laughs> Based on the shot's previous blocking, I don't think Electricity is supposed to be jumping from behind this building. Like for one, that would mean he's gigantic. And for two, he's already on the same street in this shot right here. This seems like a layering error. He shouldn't be jumping from behind the building. He could just scream at you. Did he know that's a robot or was he just trying to kill him right here? I guess he was because he's about to try to kill him anyways here. So it's less surprising with Ben 23. In fact, could that be why he's never considered a good alien? Because he's literally killing every alien he comes across. They just don't have a chance to be like, no, no, I'm good. I swear. You got to think about it. Because like when you're like 10 to 13 years old, you probably don't take it as seriously that you're like taking somebody's life when you shoot fire at their face. An entire nest of evil aliens has been discovered. Aliens. Man, this would have been perfect to have Sect appear. Is it Sect or actually what's it called? Cause I know they change it in a uh, Omniverse. I'm just gonna head canon that this is Lieutenant Steel in Dimension 23. <laughs> and for those that want to say that can't be Steel because he's a different race. Well, look at this guy, boom. Hey, it's that move he did against Vilgax. And there's the standard uh, plumber rifle here. Ah, oh, Ben, cool your jets. Now, I wouldn't say the music takes away the tension of the scene too, but the pacing definitely does. I feel like we needed a couple more seconds to really sit with this and understand what's about to happen. Here. But again, maybe they're purposefully not doing that to not make this too dramatic for Cartoon Network. I think they really are just afraid to go super serious after Ultimate Alien got so dark. This guy created your watch. It's called an Omnitrix. Hey. He's so big. This is also the first time we see a classic series style Omnitrix come off so easily. So this goes to show that it's not the device's evolution that makes it detach easier and easier and be less connected to Ben. It's the evolution of the show and how they write the Omnitrix. Like this is fucking ridiculous. 
Like this is, ah, uh, why? Why can they just take off the watch so easily now? That's, uh, I'll never get over that. That's like one of the worst things they do and they keep doing it. Hell, if he hasn't taken that off for three years, that shit should be like really infused into him. You're rich and you haven't killed anybody yet, kid. Stop while you're ahead. Is this a joke that rich folks kill people? I mean, it's not wrong, but wow. It was meant for your grandfather. Sadly, it arrived too late. He was already gone. All right, so that kind of destroys my Max 23 died fighting this universe's Vilgax. So like, why has 23 never met Vilgax? It's gotta be a case of like, things just happen differently in this universe beyond Ben just growing up without Max. Like things were different from the start here. Of course, when you take into account the other stuff, like Gwen not being an anodyne, nanomech species being an actual species in this universe. Apparently, Dr. Vegito is the dimensional equivalent to Dr. Anna. I, I wouldn't have gotten that. Though I do think this would have been interesting if like the only change was that Ben didn't have Max and you get to see the true differences of how much Max's influence would have affected Ben's life and thus the course of their universe. Which you do kind of get here, but with how many things are different regardless of whether or not Max is there, it does take away from that a little bit more. But I wouldn't say that makes this a bad story. That's just my preferences speaking. But it goes to show that this universe is a lot more different off the bat. It's not just that Ben grew up without Max. Looks like other realities have suffered the same fate. Nope, I've still got my Max. Yeah, rub it in, Ben. Keeps me from becoming you, I guess. See, now this is supposed to be some sort of revelation on how important Max's advice is to Ben, which balances this beginning scene. But like I said earlier, Max's problem with Ben in this episode specifically never seemed to be an issue, at least not one that I can significantly recall, because he gets the job done. But also Max's advice is like a core part of who Ben is. In fact, one of his biggest arcs in Alien Force is realizing that he needs to be able to act without Max's advice. So this is like kind of a non-issue that Ben has right now just for this episode. It's just, I feel like like we could have done without the Ben needs to learn to accept Max's advice sort of thing. I guess we haven't really gotten a storyline like this in Omniverse yet. So if we're really hitting all the beats, you got to cover this at some point. But like, I, I think there could have been a better anchor for this. Like Ben doesn't have to go to a whole other dimension to learn how important Max's advice has been to him. He's known that for six years, at least. So that also does kind of sully the, the moral theme of this episode for me. It's just kind of like there just to like be a building block for the story. It doesn't feel like this is something Ben needs to go through. Within the context of the episode, I still think it's a pretty good story. That's not fair. I... I miss Grandpa Max. And 23 can't even argue with him. He just so broken over the loss of Max. Like this really should have been a scene that was treated with like the feedback flashback levels of seriousness. I feel like we really needed this. Merchandise and endorsements are no substitute. But no, go ahead and throw me in some of those doop. Do, 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 dum, dum. I'm sorry, I'm being mean right now. Who asked you, alien? You don't get it. You just almost crossed a line. Like, it doesn't have to be like orchestral choir strings, you know, but it's just like, this is distracting. So what you did was wrong. You're gonna start acting your age, because I know you want to be a hero more than a mogul. This is some good shit. This is what we got to lean Ben into more. Oh, this makes me wish he took something away from this episode, but man, we still got to put Ben through the ringer. This is the kind of Ben I want to be seeing throughout Omniverse. How am I supposed to know the good aliens from the bad ones. You talk to them. You're not alone. We just couldn't penetrate that tough skull of yours. <gasps> Sorry, I tried to rip you in half. I think this is yours. What? Two. So all that Hoaxstar stuff I talked about earlier, how it services the episode well. I also think it's necessary to build that up a bit to make this moment more significant. Where Ben 23's first public act of defending aliens rather than fighting them is to try to sway the public's view on Hoaxstar's shop. So it's an immediate chance to prove himself and show that he can change. I'll vouch for this door and the monsters inside. It's a start. But a booming business. Now switch off the stabilizers between dimensions. You've been doing the equivalent of stepping on the brake and the accelerator at the same time. I love that explanation for the audience, but given it's a Galvin talking to a Galvin, I feel like that analogy doesn't work. When you think about it, like, does he really need to give a fellow Galvin that analogy? He should be saying that to, like, Hoaxstar or something. Listen to this guy like you'd listen to Max. You don't have to worry about me. Oh, look at them! Is it funnier to have him just shove the straw through his mask, or should we have gotten it open for him to drink? Who can say? What a lost opportunity for profit! <laughs> You can come back, right? Now you fix the stabilizer. Just come back every now and then. You're good, bro. 
Was there always a lightning bolt in the logo right here? Grandpa Max! You can't just take off like that without letting anybody know where you're going. Yes, he can. What? Where did that come from? You're gonna be 17 for crying out. Somehow Ben is still 16 in the series. You know what would have been neat? If they had like an episode about Ben's 17th birthday in Omniverse. I would have loved to see that. It could be about literally anything. I really don't care. Just have Ben turn 17 in the episode. Hell, you can even just like take any existing episode and throw in a C plot that, oh, it's also Ben's birthday today. Like what they did with Ben 10,000, how it was like grandpa's birthday, but it's not like the episode was grandpa's birthday. I'm scrolling through the Omniverse episodes now, trying to think of which existing episode would be best to try to weave a, it's also Ben's birthday in this episode plot line into it. And I can't think of one immediately. I'd have to really sit here and think about it. And I've been recording for two hours. I'm, I'm tired. Why are you looking at me like that? Just keep yelling at me. It's kind of okay. sweet. You don't need the big speech moral wrap up. If you were gonna do this plot line, this is a nice way to end it. We learned the lesson alongside Ben. He doesn't need to reiterate it to Max. You get what this means without them stating it. The lesson itself, ah. Okay, so this is another breakdown where I talked so much about how I thought about this episode. I don't really need to go into it too much in the rating. So let's just bang this out. Plots of four, great stuff here, held together by some shaky but valid threads. Maybe could have used another draft or so, but everything here is great. It's just not exceptional. Same with the characterization. Let's throw another four at. You. All the character stuff is good. All the writing is good. It's just all built on stuff. I feel like we didn't need to go through again. And I feel like a big strength for 23's revelation about good aliens is because of the audience's previous attachment to Tetrax and Azimuth. Not 6-6 six, six, though. That was another good way to make a twist, but we know inherently that they're good. So at first we're expecting a twist that they're bad, but then it reinforces, no, they are good. I just kind of wish they were in the episode a little bit more. There's not really room for them, but that still doesn't make the characterization flawless. Visuals though, it's a five. I had my criticisms, but it's just cool seeing alternate universes and alternate bends. It's cool comparing it to the Prime universe. The fights are great. The blocking's great. The animation is great. It might take a little bit more of a critical eye to really understand why this gets a five, but if you don't think about it, you just think it's cool because it's an alternate universe. If you really think about it, it's cool because the animation is just fucking fantastic in this episode. And you can compare all the Easter eggs, so yeah, five sounds pretty good. Importance is a five. This really starts emphasizing why the show is called Ben 10. Omniverse. And of course, he's like the most significant alternate Ben, not only because he has the most subsequent appearances, but because in the fandom, everybody knows Ben 23. You gotta see his introductory episode. And it also just opens up the Omniverse more. It's fascinating and entertaining for everything beforehand. It's a no brainer. This is a five. Yo. <laughs> I promise you, I did not plan this. We're gonna finish this off with a 23 out of 25. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Yep, there you go. So a little fun fact here. What I assume is Will Harang is briefly mentioned in this episode. It got a little drastic there for a while, Will. But I just kept thinking of the fans. And while we got a ton of Ben Prime's aliens in this episode, it kind of overshadows the fact that we only got three of Ben 23's aliens. Although we do get a lot of name drops too. I'm surprised how empty this episode doesn't feel despite the lack of aliens. Also in this shot, Tetrax pulls a whole ass rifle out of his pocket. Like what the fuck? And I can't believe I missed this parallel too. Ben, cool your jets. Ben, cool your jets. And after the last poll with an incredible 77,000 votes, 63% of you prefer classic series Upchuck over all the other designs. And I must say, you all have great taste. For this week's poll, I'd like to switch it up and ask you a pretty fun question. While Ben 23 does return, we don't get another episode centered around his dimension, but if we did, which Dimension 23 counterpart are you most interested in seeing? Dimension 23 Rook, Kevin, Gwen, or Vilgax? Let me know what you think in the community tab when this video goes live. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your weekend. And as always, keep it snazzy.